How has it been playing Hedwig? It's really exciting. I'm playing a sort of this amazing cult character that people have a deep respect and admiration for, and it feels amazing. I feel really lucky, especially now, sort of where we are in American history and in American culture. I feel like this character has a little more importance than she's had before, so I'm really honored to play her now. Would you mind telling us about the show? It was originally played sort of in the downtown art scene in New York with John Cameron Mitchell, who wrote the book, and Stephen Trask, who wrote the music. They were both in it. I mean, it's an amazing story, really. You know, yes, it's about this transgendered woman from Germany who's sort of into 80s punk and can be quite confrontational. And it's about her life story. It's about her family. It's about her loves and her relationships. But ultimately, what it is about is about the question of love. What does it mean to love oneself? What is love? Who deserves love? Is love for everybody? Is everyone going to get love? And she asked these sort of large questions about that subject at the start of the evening and then spends the rest of the hour and a half sort of searching for the answer. And that's basically the show in a nutshell. There's so much more that happens than that. It's a big, flashy show on top of all of that. But for me, that's the, the fundament of what it's about. And it's been around for a while. It's, there's actually been other versions of Hedwig in most of the towns I've been to, whether they're played in the back room of bars or whether they're played in little theatres or whether they're played in community theatres. It's a play, actually, that's done a lot. It just hasn't had as much exposure as it has had since the broad be run in 2014. How were you first introduced to Hedwig and the Angry Inch? Actually, I was first introduced via the movie, as many people were, because, you know, theater is expensive. A lot of people who speak of the movie first, or, or they have a favorite from the, you know, they travel to New York for three nights just to see Neil Patrick do it, or just to see Darren do it. It's the kind of thing that once you've seen it once, you kind of fall in love with it and want to see it 50 times. So for me, I bought the movie on the old iTunes, and this was before the show, but after I got the job, I mean, I must have watched the movie another 10, 11 times in a month just to sort of relearn what it was about. It was, it was John's movie that did it for me first. What can audiences expect from seeing the show? I'm not sure what they can expect. I think if you come with expectations, you'll have your mind blown or you'll be disappointed. That tends to happen with expectations. Either whatever you're seeing lives up to it or it doesn't. I think for me, I hope that the audience leave somewhat changed, even if it's for an hour even if it's for a day, if it was fundamentally, that would be great too. There are people who, you know, Broadway would come just because it's Hedwig and that's the show. When you're on tour, a lot of these theaters have subscription audiences who've bought tickets well in advance. You know, you're not just meeting headheads, as they like to call themselves. You're meeting people who wouldn't necessarily go out of their way to see this show, but they see it because it's part of the theater that they particularly support. But I, I hope that people learn something from seeing it, even those who've seen it before. And you are, of course, no stranger to cross-dressing, having played Boy George in his musical Taboo. Yeah, I have played George, and he certainly does you know, wear as, as much makeup as Hedwig does. The difference is that George is a boy, he's always been a boy, he likes being a man. George is not confused by his gender. He was gender-bending, as they called him at the time, and he deliberately bent gender. Well, yeah, I remember learning about Taboo through the documentary Show Business, The Road to Broadway. Uh -huh. Would you mind describing your experience with the show? When it came to New York, I'd already been with it for about 18 months, almost two years in London. It was actually more successful as a piece of theatre in London than it was in New York, sadly. Mm -hmm. I'd sort of lived this sort of boy Georgian life for two or three years at that point. So bringing it to the US was a surprise. I didn't know it was going to happen. And it was a great bonus. But we came at a time when there was a new script being worked on and Rosie O'Donnell was the director and suddenly the show had this other focus on it. Even though Taboo didn't have a long life on Broadway, you still got a claim for it. You were Tony nominated. Uh-huh. Taboo was good for me. Taboo was good for me in London and it was good for me in New York and it continues to be good for me. It's one of those things I think that will be a sort of marker in my career forever. It will always be something that I'll be able to go back to and look at with pleasure and know that it sort of helped create the years I've had since. And I think other people who saw it or who saw the documentary or who listened to the album, they also go back to that period. And Taboo is a bit of a marker for that moment in their lives. I've been very lucky and I know that and I, I try and keep that in mind when I'm having the hard times and I'm not getting work or I'm not very good at the auditions or when things aren't going my way. It, you know, I, I try hard to keep in mind what that felt like and how I sort of misused it also. It wasn't all wine and roses. I mean, I, I was young and I was stupid and I didn't appreciate it in the way I would appreciate it today if the same experience came along. I mean, I honestly think it's why I appreciate Hedwig, this experience and the character 
more than I ever did appreciate taboo in New York and that experience because I've had 13 more years of life, 13 more years of distance, 13 more years of hardship, and it really makes the good times worth even more. Uh, since Tapu, you'd been back on Broadway twice. Your first time back was in the 2007 revival of Cyrano de Bergerac, where you got to perform opposite Kevin Klein. And Jennifer Garner, actually. And uh, she's wonderful. I love her. She's just such a genuine, kind, funny, sweet lady. I really love her. That was an interesting experience, though. There was a strike. It was an IATSE strike. IATSE went on strike, and it was a seven-week run, and we lost three weeks of it. Or it was an eight-week run, and we lost three weeks of it. And, of course, Equity agreed to stand on the picket line with IATSE, so some of us would be there, you know, two or three days a week over the three-week strike. And it sort of clouded the experience a little bit. When you get a Broadway job, when you get any job in the theatre, it's a thrill. And then when some external force comes along and sort of takes it away from you, it's kind of sad. But at the same time, I actually were fighting for rights that I believed in, and I was quite happy to strike, and I was quite happy to support that. I am a unionist. I do believe in those powers. And so I was happy to be there and, and do all I could do as another voice toward their cause. But at the same time, that's the one overarching memory of that entire piece, how wonderful Jennifer Garner was and how sad it was that we didn't get to finish the show. Well, hey, at least the production lives on through the filmed performance that's now available on Broadway HD. That's right, and that's why having these performances filmed and put into the Lincoln Library and in other Broadway libraries in which you can see these things, it's wonderful. It's really, I don't think they did it for Taboo, though, or did they? I'm not sure. I'm not sure that Taboo is filmed. I have no idea. Yeah, but one would hope it was. And your most recent Broadway appearance was in Sondheim on Sondheim in 2010. That's right. That was wild. I was working with Barbara Cook and Vanessa Williams, Norm Lewis, Tom Wolf. I mean, a great cast of people. But particularly for me, it was Vanessa and Barbara because you know, they're both women from different worlds and obviously many years apart. But with sort of Broadway chops and fame and fortune, all the things that come with it, and they were both so down to earth and so welcoming to us sort of lesser you know, mere mortals you know I sang a beautiful from Sunday in the Park with George with Barbara playing mother I still think it's the highlight of my career we sat on the set piece that rolled up, rolled on and we performed this song and for me just looking at her in her eyes as she's singing and hearing that voice and she's holding my hand and we're looking at each other and we're connecting it was a beautiful moment I think we did five months with that show and every night I looked forward to that moment and with Vanessa I didn't really get to sing much with Vanessa on stage but every night I looked forward to hanging out in Vanessa's dressing room because she was just so giving and funny and she always had a story and she was open and in fact that year I was asked to do Broadway Bears which I'd never I'd seen but I'd never been part of it before I was asked to sort of MC it kind of thing and they asked if I would help them sort of rope Vanessa Williams into it I never thought she would say yes I thought she'd be horrified by the idea but I asked and she laughed and we laughed together and she said yes and in the end the two of us got ready in her dressing room because it was right across the Rosen Ballroom it was right in the theatre and we ran across and we hosted this evening and with Kristen Chenoweth also she just was so down to earth she never approached any thing with a sort of idea. you know she's got a lot of history both in the theatre and Miss America pageant and all the rest of it all that history of her singing career modelling career and she doesn't carry any of that with her she's just so cool She's one of my favorite ladies in the industry, I have to say, really, truly. That's interesting, because I've heard a couple rumors, well, at least on something, that she would have been not so nice on some point. That, I imagine, can be true for most actors and actresses. I think it's probably more true for actresses, because they have a harder time. They're competing not just against their peers for jobs, but actresses are meant to stay young and beautiful forever. That's got to be hard. She never did that with us, and I've never heard of that before. But if that's ever happened before, you kind of have to be a little forgiving in the world of the arts and what it means to be a beautiful woman in the arts. I imagine it's possible if everyone, look, I'm not a beautiful woman in the arts, but I can be bitchy too if I really need to be. <laughs> <laughs> I forgive her those rumors if they're even true. And uh, would you mind if I asked you about your son? No, no, I have an eight-year-old son, yeah, he's working in the arts himself, actually. He's got doing little online reviews, and now he's got a TV show for HBO coming out. He's done a bunch of movies. Like, he's going to be a proper superstar, this boy, which is really fantastic. And he seems to genuinely love it, you know, and for as long as he is loving it, then I don't see anything wrong with him continuing it. You know, I've seen some horror stories of what can happen to young people when they start early, and I've seen some wonderful outcomes. I think it's just about influence in his life and parenting and all the rest of it and so far that's going really well
Uh, we should say that your son happens to be the young internet theater critic Ian Armitage. Has he seen you in the show? If so, what's his review? Yeah, he has seen the show. He saw it when it was in Seattle. The stage management crew asked him, because he also saw the show in its original run with Neil Patrick Harris, and he mm-hmm. loved it and thought it was fantastic. The stage manager said to him afterwards, and I was there, and we were all standing around, and she said, so what did you think of the show with your dad in it? Because I know you've seen it before. What did you think? And he, and this is quote, he said, it was almost as good as the first time. It basically means that he liked Neil Patrick Harris better. But everyone's entitled to their opinion including my son. So what advice would you like to give to any aspiring young performers out there? Over the last few years, I've had moments of, why am I doing this? What is this for? And listed moments where I realize how much I love it and why I'm doing it. I think you have to love it. I mean, I know that sounds like such a cliche and people say that about everything, but I think it's particularly true of this industry because in this industry, what you're selling is yourself. So by saying you have to love it means you have to love yourself. It's really difficult to, I mean, many actors are horribly insecure, which creates awful people soaked in the mess of desperation. And that's actually more common than I'd care to admit, but it's out there. And it's not nice and it's nasty. And that's when you start to hear the rumors of them being a bitch and being awful. And, you know, you hear people of certain actresses go crazy and they've got horrible reputations. And I think for me, if you love yourself and love yourself inside the industry, then you'll have a much easier time and you'll be able to deal with the down times and the rejection that inherently comes with being an actor, being a performer, being a singer. So more than anything, I mean, yeah, get an education, train to be an actor, yes, all of that. There's many famous people who didn't train, who didn't get an education as an actor. You know, it can just happen for some people. My son's never had any theatre training or any acting training and he's doing brilliantly. I think it's just really about knowing your place in your own life, knowing its place in your life, giving the importance that it deserves without giving it too much importance and loving yourself and knowing that you deserve the success and the rest should be treated as such. Uh, Ewan, I thank you very much for devoting your time to this interview and I hope you have a great time in Durham. Oh, thank you very much, my friend. It's really nice to talk to you and happy new year.